thank you and welcome. We have a excellent slide um, manager who who might like to um, move along for the next the next slide. Now somebody has their hand up that's pushing the limits of our technology. So I just want to have um, a, say a big welcome. Tonight we're learning together as I explained earlier in difficult times, but we are celebrating that we're able to hold this inaugural Dogs Victoria online webinar and share the knowledge tonight at a national level. It's pretty exciting as far as I'm concerned. We begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of our land, paying respect to elders past, present and emerging and their spiritual connection to country. Welcome everybody. This is a learning journey, as I said, for all of us. Please be patient as we had hone our technology skills. So, some webinar ed etiquette. <laughs> as we have well over 100 participants, getting closer to the 200 mark, and I'd better keep admitting the people as they're ticking in, it's magic. Um, we would like to remind you of some of the rules to try and make the meeting run nice and smoothly. Check that your microphone is muted to minimise interruptions. Uh, the chat function is enabled where participants can type their responses. Whilst we've had some beautiful welcoming um, uh, messages, please can you now just keep your comments succinct, of course they'll be respectful, but that will make it much easier for us to interact with our um, wonderful presenters. The webinar, as we explained earlier, and I want to make very clear that it's being recorded, we hope that it will, and that I believe might include the chat information, but just pretend it is because I can't confirm that. Um, but um, that will make it available for everybody once we upload it onto the um, YouTube channel for Dogs Victoria. So uh, I would now like to hand over to Sylvia, who is the chair of the Victorian uh, Canine Health and Wellbeing uh, committee and she will introduce our presenters this evening. Thanks Margaret. Um, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for such an overwhelming response. We're, we're very gratified and very heartened. I'd like to welcome our two presenters, uh, Dr Roger Lavelle and Ron De Jong. Uh, Ron is the developer and administrator of the ORCID database and he's worked tirelessly to develop it and broaden its capabilities. Uh, and there's an awful lot more to do, isn't there, Ron? <laughs> Dr. Roger Lavelle will be known to all of you, having been really the backbone of our efforts to improve our hip and elbow screening in Victoria for many years. Um, let's begin with Ron and he will go through and answer the questions that have been submitted concerning ORCID. Um, if you have any comments or further questions or whatever, um, please enter them in the, in the chat section and we will attempt to address them. Thank you very much, Ron. Okay, can uh, everyone hear me? Yes, yes, okay, I think it's all good, going. Good. Yes. Um, so, uh, Orchid from memory uh, was something that uh, Hugh Gent came up with and it stands for Originating Canine Health Information Database, which kind of says what it is. It is an online database for storing health data. Uh, you can access it with a browser at uh, orchid.ankc.org.au. So we currently store hips and elbows, spines, eyes for individual dogs, and eyes for litters. The information it provides to the public 
is the context for the CHED and ACES panellists. Uh, various ACEs information such as breed schedule, guide for owners and rules. Uh, there's also a page on how to use the website. And uh, we have live statistics which are updated daily, uh, actually the next day based on what's been entered. Uh, now that's been restricted to the last five years of, of entries. Um, now we've only been going since September 2016, so it's uh, it's actually uh, somewhat less than that. And uh, the live statistics has the hips and elbow scores. Um, we don't have the ophthalmology scores yet. Um, now all the stats that we report on are for both public and private. So what I mean by that is if the, the owner has designated it to be published, the, the results to be published publicly or, or whether they stay private. The, uh, the public health results are searchable, so you don't need to log in. Uh, you can search by registration, breed, name, microchip and exam ID. If you are an ANKC member, you can log in with your person number and password. And that is the same as when you log in to your state body's website. Um, now, when a member does log in, they would see the private results, but just for their own dogs, not for anyone else's dogs, obviously. The, uh, the health results are entered by panellists. So that's the, the radiologists and the ophthalmologists enter it directly. Uh, we also have one or two uh, trusted individuals who would be entering historic results from the original paper results. Um, now ANKC members can request to have the publish permission permission changed if their identity can be verified. So currently there's there's two ways they can do that. One is to email uh, me. Well, there's, there's an email address on the website uh, with from the registered email address. And when I say registered, I mean according to the ANKC. And unfortunately, a lot of the owner details that I see don't have a registered email address, which makes it a little bit more difficult. They can, however, log in with their person number, as I mentioned before, and then request it through that portal. As I mentioned before, ORCID uh, started in September 2016. Uh, we did start with a spreadsheet of historical results uh, that Karen Hedberg was good enough to forward to us. Um, and um, so the other thing ORCID handles, of course, is appeals. And now a result from an appeal overrides any previous results. Um, and a note that the panelists and the state bodies and uh, the ANKC can still see all the previous results. Um, so, you know, in some cases there are multiple results. Uh, more on that later. Uh, the ORCID system has daily and monthly backups. So just to make sure we don't lose any data. Uh, panelists can modify results that they have previously entered, uh, but only for results that they have entered. So they can't modify results that another panelist has entered. And uh, all the changes made to results are recorded in an order trail. So we've, we've got a complete history of every change that's made. Um, I think that was uh, one of the questions. Was there 
Am I reading out the questions? <laughs> Sylvia? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, okay. Thank you referring All right, the next question I have here is um, I'm especially interested in the discussion on ORCID, but I can't find any information on this on the ANKC website. I'm assuming this is the database yet to be developed on the genetic results of ANKC registered dogs. Um, okay, there is a link on the ANKC website to ORCID and it's on the big banner that you see on the website. Now the tricky thing is it's, it's a rotating banner. So you've either got to be patient and wait for it to rotate in or click, keep clicking uh, the buttons on the left or the right to, um, to show that. But it's a fairly big um, banner that links to ANKC, uh, to, the, to the ORCID website. Um, in terms of genetic results, that was definitely um, scheduled to be added, but for various reasons, we haven't got around to, to adding it. The next question I have here is, can you please explain how the breed average can be ascertained when there is less than 50% of score results for a breed over the last 30 years? That is true. Um, you know, we can only do what we can do. Um, breeders do seem to demand seeing the average figures on the certificates. So we could leave it to the, um, to the radiologist to calculate that, but it's quite burdensome. So we do calculate it. And as I say, it is based on the last five years, but in this particular case, all results up until September 2016. Um, now, there are some older results from, uh, as I mentioned, from Karen Hedberg's spreadsheet. There are about 30,000 entries in there. Uh, we did do a lot of data cleaning just to make sure that all the the names in the spreadsheet match the registration numbers. We did find quite a few that didn't match. Uh, so unfortunately we had to delete those. So um, yeah, if we're unsure about any data, we just, our only option is to delete it basically. Um, the next question was, what data is used to obtain breed averages? Example, when I log in, I have 18 dogs represented on the ORCID system. I have 21 plus not listed. I have some dogs not appearing that were scored the same day as others, yet some are listed, some are not, or were owned by me. Uh, I'm not sure I can 100% answer that, but I will explain that the breed averages are calculated daily at the start of each day. So if they were entered at some point in the day and you looked on the same day, you wouldn't see it. You'd have to wait till the next day. So there's um, quite a few calculations that go into those breed averages. And one of them, as I think I mentioned, is the appeals. So an appeal overrides any previous results. The next question I have here is, why do dogs appear twice on the ORCID system? Um, I had a quick look. In some cases, uh, I've seen results for the same dog five times, uh, which seems somewhat unlikely. I think some of them might be historic. But uh, look, it does happen. Uh, we have four scorers um, on the panel. And look, we don't want to lose any previous scores. So if a new score comes in, we're not going to get rid of previous scores. I think that's important information that we need to hold on to. But um, in terms of what's reported in the stats, for example, um, only the last result applies unless of course there's an appeal and in that case the appeal applies uh, even if there is a later 
uh, result entered for that dog. The appeal always prevails. As far as I know, we've never had uh, more than one appeal. Um, so yeah, if you do log in with your person number, you may see multiple results for your dogs. The public will only ever see the last result, or as I mentioned, if it's been appealed, the appeal result. Um, now an appeal can be just for the elbows or just for the hips. So it'll modify just the appropriate one. Okay, next question I have is some score, some score different examiner number. I'm not <laughs> sure what that. Same score. Um, some score different. No, same, same score. Oh, same score, different examiner number, both with identical zero all around scores. Yeah, as I said, there's nothing stopping a dog being scored multiple times. Um, that's, anyway, I've, I think I've already answered that. The next question is, I'd like to know if it was possible to search for dogs that have certain sets of health criteria to complement my dog's bloodlines to assist me in selecting the most compatible breeding. Uh, so at the moment, Orchid doesn't do complicated searches. Um, so I would imagine a search would want to restrict, say, the sex or date of birth, the, the range of date of births for starters. Um, it doesn't do that. Um, and the next question I have here is, it would be great for this database to work out inbreeding coefficients in planned litters. Is this possible? So the... ANKC Bree, uh, yeah, the pedigree database is a separate database and we access it through what's called an API. So we have a very narrow window on that data. So we can get all the data for a particular entry, but to do an inbreeding calculation, you would typically have to go at least 10 generations, which could be a thousand entries. So the interface isn't fast enough to allow us to do that. Um, but, you know, it's something that, that could be done in the future. Um, the next question I have here is also, can we import the data from Oravet for health and trait, resulting, uh, trait testing results and record against dogs on the ANKC database? Uh, I think that sort of came up before with the question on genetics, uh, genetic results. Um, we are planning to do it. The data would obviously have to be entered at the source. So Oravet or any other genetic testing company, uh, we would have to provide them with accounts and the ability to, um, to enter that. And I would imagine that the... Um, you know, there might be some standard forms. The vet would have to verify the dog's identity when taking the, the sample and then provide the, uh, the microchip and registration and name to, uh, with the sample to the genetic testing company. As I mentioned, it is something we are planning to do. Uh, next question was, are vet diagnosed conditions able to be recorded against our dogs, such as Addison's and epilepsy? Uh, I, I don't know that I'm 100% uh, qualified to answer that. I can say technically it is definitely possible, but again, it would be the practitioner who would be entering that. We can't rely on the owners to enter that. So that would mean rolling out ORCID to a much larger pool of professionals, which is possible. Um, and I, I think there's probably also questions about whether the owner would want the vet to enter that information. So that's beyond my purview. The next question I have here is, why isn't there one standard form for ANKC ORCID cheds? 
hip and elbow scheme. So yes, there are differences in the forms and some radiologists prefer to use their own forms and, and I don't see any issue with that at all. Um, there's nothing really on the form that gets copied across except the contact information for the current owner. Um, so the current legal owner isn't always the owner as recorded in the ANKC database. Um, as far as the ANKC is concerned, the owner has to be a member of the ANKC for starters. So basically all the important information that's in the uh, hips and elbows result is copied directly from the ANKC database. So all the details on the dog, everything is recorded from the ANKC database and the rest of it is entered by the uh, radiologist and so forth. So I don't think there's an issue. We have a question here, um, Ron, that fits in. Someone's asking about co-owned dogs and who um, is able to put the information in onto you know, who gives permission for that information to be published? Yeah, that's a tricky one. Um, so I would yeah, suggest that's, that's... that the owner it would have to be the owner of the dog. The current owner of the dog would, would have the right as to whether the, uh, whether the information is, is upgraded or not, uploaded or not. But some dogs can be co-owned. Yes, if they're co-owned, certainly. But if, if, if there's a situation where the breeder is not the owner, then, then the, I don't believe the breeder can override the owner. Well, on the form it says contact, uh, the contact name and address and email. It doesn't actually say the owner name and email, etc. Although that is filled in from the database, but the... Um, so what is on the form would, would be on there. The presumption, I guess, would be that the person who has possession of the dog owns the dog. So yeah. it's a tricky question. If there's co-owners, do, do we get both owners to sign off? So that's probably a question that needs to be um, clarified and we can relay the... Um, the answer to uh, the people that have attended the attended tonight is everybody happy with that? If we do that, well, that that's a great way for uh, people to get something out of the evening. Yes. Yep. 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 The other point is the quite a few dogs are in the process of being transferred, and they come in from the person who's about to become the owner. So that contact place is very helpful because you can have the current ANKC owner, if you like, down as the owner, but the impending owner would come under the contact bit because we can't get the results back to the original owner if the contact person's the one that's done all the x-raying, paid for it and submitted the forms. So that contact, position is quite helpful. So I think we can, I think we'll put that down as a, um, let's look into it and come up with some answers about different situations with that. I've noted that down, Sylvia, thanks. Okay, um, so next question was, are non-verified, as in prior to September 2016 results, being routinely cleansed from ORCID or is it solely reliant on those errors being emailed to the support address? Um, if it is solely being cleansed from emailed reports, will they be openly accepted or will it be from the dogs on owners only? Look, we can't really change any results that are in there unless we have the original forms and, and even then it can be tricky. Um, we haven't had too many issues with that, but um, our response is that if we believe that the historic results are incorrect, 
Uh, and normally it's the details like the name or there was a mix up between the name and the microchip. It was a sibling or something like that. Then, as I said before, all we can do is delete it. We do make a note uh, when you are searching for health results that anything prior to the 12th of September is not verified. Verified meaning that it was actually entered by the practitioner. Um, now, here's the last question I have here is a, um, there are duplicate and varied results for the same dogs and incorrect spelling of names of dogs attached to the results. Um, I have actually seen incorrectly spelled names in the ANKC database. Now we can't change that. We just have to accept it, you know, what it, whatever we get. Um, uh, but as far as I know, we, we've done a complete cleansing of all the past results um, from Karen's um, database to ensure that the breed and the registration number match the name. So any issues we found there, if we can't, if we see it's an obviously slight misspelling in the name, we can fix that. But apart from that, we've, we've just had to delete them. But um, no, there's no real cleansing going on. Uh, we don't really have enough original historic results to go on with. And I think that's it for me. Uh, Ron, could we just have you repeat, I'm scrolling up through the questions here, the actual web address for ORCID, please. Oh, okay. Well, um, just think of ankc.org.au and just put ORCID on the front. So it's ORCID.ankc.org.au. We'll also Carol says is actually has actually written that in the in the chat um, a, a fair way up. But if you scroll through, you'll find it. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Ron. Um, have we got any more questions? We've, um, this has been so useful because there's different aspects um, that people are looking at the database from, coming up with questions that we've never actually thought of. Um, really interesting one is how does frozen semen, how is frozen semen recorded? So we will go through um, and get some answers to these questions for everybody. Um, and Sarah's just commented also a heap of typos in the names when compared to the database. So um, I think we need to establish a protocol by which uh, dog owners can submit um, corrections uh, to, to names to, um, to have that sorted. So we need to get that organised as well. Look, as that's I said that, before, that's, that's possible with pre-September 2016. So by all means, just... Um, well, look, I thought we had gone through and uh, cleansed all of that, but... Yeah, no problems with informing us. If all we're changing is the name, then that's okay. Sure, sure. There's a question here about um, how ANKC members create an ORCID account. Um, is a person number the ANKC member number? Yes, so whatever, as, as I said before, whatever you log into your state body with is the same account and password. And I also have a question, and I'll just read it out exactly right. Currently on the ORCID database, the spine scores are displaced, displaced incorrectly. This was emailed to someone last week. Is there any time frame when this is going to be rectified? Um, not quite with you there. What, what do you mean the spine? I'm a, that, that's why I'm only reading out exactly what's come through from Nicole. The spine scores on the stats? That must be the stats is the only place you can see them. The database only shows a score of zero to three rather than complete, completely score of each dog. Don't know. Can we, uh, maybe whoever's controlling the screen, could you? Oh, it's something to do with Dr. Dr. Makara. He does the French Bulldogs. 
This must have been a private message. It hasn't come through. Can you can you unprivate it, Margaret? Do you think? Oh, I do, oh, I don't know. So let's uh, hang on. One of one of the things with those French bulldog and other spine scores is that you can add up all the individual scores for the vertebrae that are abnormal, um, and I've got no idea whether it's any use to anybody knowing what that number is. Um, or you can just give a figure at the end, which is the 0 to 3 bit that's being used at the moment, which puts the dog in the view of the uh, person who's looked at the pictures as to whether they're naught with a very good looking spine and not likely to be any problems, or if there are three, they're going to have at least one very bad space, or they may have a lot of individual spaces that suggest this dog has the potential for problems. So. If you if you go from naught to twenty nine or something, I don't know that you're any better off than naught to three because I don't think we know what any of those figures actually really mean. I think that probably goes a fair way to answering Nicole's question. I would have thought, and she does say that the question had been sent to um, Dr. Makara, so perhaps that would well be. Um, the place to be pursuing that, given your comments, Roger? I think it's a good idea. I mean, I think French bull, well, the French Bulldog's the one we see most of, but the whole value of spinal examinations is something that's up for major discussion. Right. Can, can we just switch over to the, or can you have a look at the public stats on spines? And there may be an explanation on there. I just vaguely remember that there may be discussion of what the scores are. Okay, we need to log on. To, well, I, can, I can log on to the site, I think. .ankc.org.au <sighs> But then we're going to have to... There is you um, click share screen. Once you have logged in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So where does it say about spines? Ron? Um, so go to the homepage and have a look at the uh, statistics. Public health results. Yep. And I just need to go share screen, don't I? So spine. So, can anybody see that? Can you send oh, me a message? I was thinking of the spine score stats, actually. Yeah. I got that. Yeah. Just trying to get rid of this. Okay, so there it says the individual spine scores are calculated as the sum of the scores of all the vertebra. And each vertebra has a score of zero to three. So does that, does that answer the question? I think we'll have to take it as, as, as answering the question because time's moving on and we've got um, a lot of questions to get through for Roger as well. However, somebody did make the comment that Dogs West doesn't have a portal for its members to, um, to get on and neither does Dogs ACT. So perhaps that's something that you will have to do some shaking of the trees for the um, members of Dogs West and Dogs ACT. Um, 
and just to reiterate that it's the person per, what's the right word ron person, person number? number yep not your yeah. ankc number yeah because that was sort of asked again all right um and somebody asked about crossover with the GSDCA database. But that's... Well, awesome. Yeah, well, I, yeah, Roger probably needs to address that, I think. All right. Okay. So, no further questions for, for Ron at this point. Um, I'll leave it to you, Sylvia, to um, introduce Roger, who's already been doing well. You've already made your contributions. Thank you, Roger. Good night. <laughs> okay, so Roger, if, if you want to start with uh, the questions that were submitted to you initially, um, I guess the, the first thing we've, uh, uh, we've started with really is um, uh, how, like, how do we start? Why, why are we doing this? which is uh, the first question is, how do you recognize a problem with hips? What type of movement do you look for? Is there muscle wasted early or later? What's the prognosis for treatment? How do you know if genetic problem or whether caused by accident that was not witnessed as a pup, et cetera? You've got five minutes, Roger. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. <laughs> good evening, everybody. Um, one of the things that we see in um, some puppies is that they get a rolling gait, which I, I guess is a feature of attractive movement in some breeds but in other breeds it may suggest they've got some problems with their hips. They may start finding difficulty with their ability to get up and down stairs and that sort of activity and one of the things that's often reported is that they tend to bunny hop behind. Um, muscle wasters in puppies if the problem's fairly serious can um, be present and that's usually below the line of the pelvis and certainly, as if a dog's got considerable pain from the hips, it, which it might not show directly, it will limit its movement and you can get quite serious wastage. Now, the prognosis for treatment I'm not really going to discuss because that's a major um, role for um, orthopaedic surgeons and things. The genetic side of things, is it an accident or is it genetic? In puppies, for instance, the they tend, if they have accidents, to fracture their femoral necks and the lower parts of their femur if there's trauma, and they're going to be readily available. I think it's highly unlikely that an accident in puppies is going to lead to subluxation um, of the hip, and um, most of the things that people would like to be accidents um, are where it's been a genetic problem, and quite often people find the accidents occurred on the leg which has got the lower score rather than the leg with the high score. What is an ideal age to examine large and giant breeds? Well, we would take a year as a basic principle across the board. Quite a lot of people would rather they'd examine their big breeds at two years or older. If you wait longer, there's a chance that you will certainly increase any degenerative joint disease scoring. Um, you may, if it's a dog that's going to develop hip dysplasia, see some uh, more changes in the laxity a little bit later on, but that's uh, not so likely. There are no differences in the way that we score the different breeds. They're all um, looked at with the same basic um, chart of the nine sites that we examine and with the um, six up to six um, classifications of the changes that are seen in the various levels of change. I mean basically the top two are the Norberg angle and the subluxation score measuring laxity. The next um, grouping all look at the acetabulum itself for secondary changes and the ones down the bottom look at the secondary changes around the femoral head and neck. Certainly, Roger, um, yes. Sorry, sorry Roger, not to interrupt. There was also a question came in 
is hip dysplasia specifically or exclusively um, a problem of 25 plus kilo dogs? Oh, no, no. The, there are plenty of lightweight dogs that can get hip dysplasia. They're probably going to have less impact maybe on them because they are lightweight and they, if they've got reasonable muscles, they, they won't notice it. Like little Jack Russell couldn't care less about their lousy femoral heads that they get now and then and they just run around quite normally, hop a bit. But yeah, there's plenty of little dogs that can get hip dysplasia. Thank you. Thank you. Um, nutrition, um, bad nutrition is, can be either two things when it's a faulty diet problem. And the common one we used to see lots of in, in this country was overfeeding of meat. And they got all sorts of horrible folding fractures and various things wrong with them, but it had little of impact on the hips in most cases. Certainly overfeeding was one of the areas that was looked at um, around the world and increased amounts of protein, energy and minerals and things can lead to changes. Um, and that was probably a, more of an issue than the poor quality or, or lack of feed was being. I mean, if you're fed a bit less, you're probably much, you're sort of half protected to, from getting some of the problems. There's a question about can a dog have very low scores and still be able to fail? That would be highly unlikely. Um, and I'll come around in a minute to talk about fail or not. There are some breeds like the Siberians and the Ridgebacks that have, don't ever score much more than two or three on any one side ever. So if they've got one that scored four or five, uh, which would be a low score for most breeds on one side, well, then they would be seen as being worse than the breed median or breed average. The next question addresses what defines a pass or fail in hip and elbow scores? Really, um, I don't know that we really should have passes and fails. We, when the BVA started doing hips donkeys years ago in Malcolm Willis's time, they did what was called a pass, a breeder's letter, or a fail. And the pass probably had no more than two or three points on any side in, in our current system. The breeder's letter probably didn't get any more than five. And the fail went all the way from five up to 53. And it was this huge group of fails that led to the development of the scoring system so that at least people had an idea of the ones that received a fail report as to whether they were a good fail, if you like, or a bad fail. Because some of the kennels found it really difficult just knowing they've got a whole heap of fails to try and find some animals that they could sensibly use. So we tend now with the scoring to look at the status of the animal's hip in relation to the median or average. I guess we, we switch, seem to have switched across the world into medians more than average these days. There are some breed clubs that have their own guidelines or rules, if you like. The Shepherd Club have the A stamp and Z stamps, which is more related to being able to appear at various shows and things than it is about saying your dog's suitable for breeding. Certainly at the moment, the German Shepherds with the, can get an A stamp if the hips are eight and eight, which is 16, which is just about double the breed average. So that would not, whilst it passes them to go into their shows and enjoy that side of the sport, then it doesn't necessarily mean that dog is actually suitable for breeding. You've got your limit, litter limitation stuff that goes on that some breeds uh, apply constraints on what can be registered. And I guess that's to some extent being a pseudo pass or fail. And in the elbow side, we don't have any pass or fail, but the international pressure in recent years is starting to suggest that only dogs with normal elbows should be used for breeding. 
However, if they are at the very at the low end of grade one, well, some of those may well um, be, be used by people because otherwise you can you may potentially throwing out good genetic material for some aspects of the breeds for the sake of something that's probably not going to cause any problems. Just to yeah. interrupt there, Roger, there's been a question come in just at this very moment. In in one of this person's breeds, the elbow scores um, are graded more than normal of 40% of the breed. So just as you were saying, what do you do with a breed where you've got elbow grades coming in with over 40% of the breed? What, what are the recommendations regarding breeding from dogs with grade one or two or three? Well, they should clearly be breeding with dogs that are in the low grade ones if they've got nothing, if they don't have any normal ones. A bit like people have to do um, with hip dysplasia sometimes and certainly had to do in the early days when they were going through it. So the one of the things that which comes up a bit later on in the questions is um, a, a, an issue between different parts of the world and what is a grade one these days. So I'll, I'll pick that up a bit later on. But certainly Thank across you. the breeds, there seems to have been considerable tightening of the suggested guidelines as to where you split between suitable for breeding and less suitable for breeding as far as elbows, which is, puts them all really in grade one at the worst. How essential are scores where there's no breed average and how do you know what a healthy hip and elbow score is in these cases? I guess you don't, do you, if you haven't got a breed average? However, it seems sensible to, for people who want to breed with their dogs or they may have um, be a, a breed that doesn't have much database and these might be dogs they don't want to breed with, but at least they provide some data. It, it certainly is useful to get these scores. And I see a few people who have either crossbred dogs or um, pedigree, not pedigree dogs, but purebred dogs, which aren't part of the A and KC, who want to breed with them. And I always um, uh, will look at the scores and I would make a comment that it, on the status of the breeding, I had one the other day that was about 66 or something. So it was fairly simple to say that I didn't think it was very suitable. Pen hip. Is it worthwhile doing pen hip at the same time as ANKC? Well, that's up to the owners. It's, it's, there's nothing wrong with doing it at the same time. Um, it, it saves the dog having two lots of anaesthetics and things. Um, so that's up to an owner's uh, feeling about it and, and how they their veterinarian feels about the situation. I don't think it, um, it, well, it doesn't bother me how many different methods you use. The biggest issue with all these schemes is getting the owners or breeders to pay any attention to the results. <laughs> The comment here about um, some research seems to indicate that doing x-rays on hips and elbows has not had any impact on the average hip scores. Um, do we have any evidence of the usefulness of x-rays? There was certainly quite a lot of, um, if you like, negative press that people try to put out about the, the system. And one of the reasons why it appeared to be disappointing was that when people started keeping the scores they just added them on and on and on and on so if you had a breed with quite a large number of dogs in it you're going to have to get a whole lot of new ones with either very high results or very low results to have any impact on the breed average so in the last um, period of time we've been doing rolling averages when looking at the five years of the recent five years versus the other five years previous five years or so where that's available and it's clearly evident that in all the common breeds in this country and i guess in and the bba said the same thing that the scores have come down using the scoring system they um 
Labradors used to be 14 not many years ago on average and now they're down to seven or something and shepherds and rotties and things have all all come down to reasonable sort of levels and they've come to down to levels when hopefully the changes that are present are unlikely to give too much of in the way of problems with clinical hip dysplasia. So I think the x-rays are useful. If there's some other marker system that comes into play, well then they would have to do a comparison of the two, I guess. And um, it, would, it doesn't bother me if um, the dog world has a different way of looking at the uh, hip situation, but at the moment it seems to be the one way when you can at least remove the bad dogs from the program because that's one of the roles of the whole scheme is not necessarily to find the good dogs it's the bad dogs we want to keep out can pen hip results be recorded by the ankc i very much doubt it um it's a, a confidential uh, database as far as i'm aware Some comments about general anaesthetics. Um, I think there's obviously a variation in what people use to position the, assist in positioning the dogs for hips and elbow x-rays. You're supposed to be using a general anaesthetic, but there are a lot cleverer agents these days than the old fashioned um, inhalatory anaesthetics. And there is some work that suggests that if you go from a dog that's conscious to sedated, to having an anesthetic, to having a distraction view or a luxoid view, similar to the one in either with an extended VD view or as the pen hip position them, you may well increase the degree of laxity in that hip. So we at least want the dogs to be relaxed and it's up to the veterinarians to make sure that they are being um, using the right uh, agents to enable them to take the best quality x-ray to give a fair representation of how those hips look in the dog. I have had the same x-ray scored by two different vets and obtained two different scores. How can we get a uniform score? Consistency of reading and reporting. Blah, blah, blah. Well, you can get a uniform score by only getting one score. That's the easiest way. Um, the scoring program um, means that two or three people could look at the same x-ray and they could score it slightly differently in different in different places without either of those individuals being incorrect in their view which means that people shouldn't get so paranoid about one or two points with this whole system you're dealing with a, a living animal and you're dealing with a way of trying to mark positions on um, images on a on a computer screen which is not always easy to do and have it come out exactly the same way all i can say is at least from the point of view of our elbows x-rays scored by the computer well I can, as far as i'm aware no they're not and um, the, they're scored using a computer, but not by the computer. They're done with um, human measurement of the changes. And I don't think um, it would have anything to do from the zeros going to the ones. I don't see where that comes into it. Can physiotherapy, chiropractic manipulation help with a very active dog before big x-ray? I don't know what that's trying to do, but I guess if you're as well muscled as you can possibly be, it's going to help um, provide stability to the hip joint to some extent. Timing of when you do bitches, um, that's, um, there's certainly work there which um, shows that you can do 
a bitch at a numerous at different times and get slightly different results but i can assure you some of them will go up when they're in season and some will go down it says here how long after they've been whelped well you really should be getting the x-rays done before the whelped anyway or before they've been even bred would be a lot more sensible so you will get some variation in the outcome of the um score when a bitch is in in season or not in season there'll be some potential for variation what is the norberg angle there is always a score in the box the Norberg angle is one way of measuring the laxity in the hip joint. It's, there's not a uniform agreement around the world as to where you actually make your measurements. But as long as the people in the, in the individual scheme stick to the same guidelines, it should provide some consistency of the results. So the Norberg angle and the subluxation score are two points that are measuring laxity. On most occasions, the Norberg angle provides a similar score to the laxity score, the subluxation score, but that certainly doesn't have to be true that they're going to be scoring exactly the same, each one of them. elbow scoring protocols bva versus iewg the bva is the british veterinary association and the iewg is the international elbow working group and they have two slightly different views about elbow scoring so the bva only scores measurable bony protrusion beyond the normal outline of the bone. The International Elbow Working Group recognises a change in the appearance of the trochlear notch, which is part of the ulna, which is where the, the um, humerus articulates with it. And they recognize a change there. And if the change is reasonably obvious, they would grade that dog as a one. Now, the only club that I'm aware of in this country that's looking at that sort of issue is the Rottweiler Club, who have a borderline category in their elbow assessment sheet. And that elbow assessment sheet would mean that they would put down the what the International Elbow Working Group call a grade one would be a borderline and the BBA just don't recognize it at all and if you follow these dogs many of them um, down the track you can see this this change in the trochlear notch getting bigger and eventually poking out beyond the normal outline so the IEWG would have a lot more um grade one dogs um than the bva would because the bva doesn't bother um describing that change in its list and that is a bit of an issue because you are probably missing some of the dogs that um, would go on to get uh, clinical signs and it's probably under estimating the number of dogs that actually have a potential elbow issue you certainly see some dog x-rays where there are very obvious sclerotic changes around the trochlear notch with a very clear cut margin of bone on the bone and it's very hard to let those go into being a normal category so at the moment the ABA, sorry, the ANKC um, system, we are following along with the BBA system at present, and whether there should be some rethinking about that to go along with the IEWG, um, I don't know. It's up to a few of us, I think, to put our thinking caps on and 
come to you people with uh, some better advice. I know, for instance, in Holland that if you are a grade one dog um, with some change, but not measurable sticking out change, you would not be in a breeding category at that stage. However, if you resubmit one year later and you still haven't developed any uh, change outside the normal margin of the bone, that dog becomes uh, available to be bred with. So there are um, changes that could be thought about in that situation. The appeal process, I don't have much to do with the appeal process except get a few um, ones to look at. And the area where the, I've seen most appeals is the elbow. And many years ago, those of us who were brought up looking at hard copy x-rays, I would have said it was it would be fairly straightforward to see whether the there was a change in the elbow joint or not. With the modern computer systems, there are changes appearing around the elbow joint, which are really quite difficult to interpret, partly because of the way that the computer system works and partly because some people have some rotation of the elbow and I've had four or five cases in the last few months where I've pondered for a considerable length of time with different um, windowing, um, changing to the inverted image and doing all sorts of things to try and work out whether these are changes that are really occurring due to new bone formation or it's just some way that the image appears. And um, I sent some off to a colleague of mine in WA um, recently, and he was able to um, agree with me that the difficulties, but he thought that most of the changes that were there were normal. And often it was just one elbow in a dog when the other one was normal. And the other thing that was interesting was that in many cases, the elbow was fully flexed. Whereas in the dogs that have got serious changes in their elbows, they, a, they don't like it clinically, but even when you position them under anesthesia or sedation, you can't flex them up properly. So I think that was helpful to get some more advice on these and um, helped me with the quandaries that I was having. Quality control, we certainly um, could do something about doing that a bit more. If it, and certainly I'm sure it would help people feel more comfortable with the, the systems. Jenny is an old postgraduate, well, she shouldn't say she's an old postgraduate, she was a past postgraduate student of mine. And, um, we um, spent many days looking at hips and elbows together. Um, I went to see Mariano in Sydney and went over the system with him to try and explain how we ought to try and do it. And Anna spent some considerable time before she started looking at x-rays, um, either reading ones that she sent to me and then coming over and we would spend a few hours on several days looking at uh, things and I think that by and large we've got reasonably good um, correlation. Um, I remember when um, in the German Shepherd Dog Club with Graham Allen being the appeal person um, we used to get, or we didn't, uh, the owners used to complain that he and I must have colluded in the scoring of these dogs because we seem to be too similar and I guess Graham and I had met on several occasions to look at uh, x-rays to ensure that we were providing a similar interpretation as each other and so we certainly at that stage had very good correlation.
Somebody wants so, to Roger, look. before you go on to the next section, yep. there's a lot of questions have come in. Shall we, shall we give some of those a go? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, as they, as they you can, you can um, try. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, one of the questions was, what do you do in breeds that perhaps don't have a lot of scores and they don't have a very accurate average? Do you just go on and aim to get the scores lower and lower? Um, or and, and can you get throwbacks to, to previous generations of high scores that, that you didn't even know were there? Well, if, if you've got a... Um, well, I should say that the basis of the whole scoring system is to look for dogs that are, have got low scores and that are close to normal because that's what we'd like to be using. I mean, I guess that's only part of the whole dog's makeup and we shouldn't get too paranoid about only having good hits. But we want, and normal means they're going to score one, two or three in, in a couple of places and, and no more than that. If you can't find normal dogs in that very low scoring area, that's when the BVA started saying you should look at only breeding with dogs that had a score that was less than the breed average. We did some, well, we, we spoke to Mark and Willis some years ago about that and his idea, because we had um, brought up the idea of dogs being suitable for breeding if the highest scoring hip was less than half the breed average. And he thought that was quite a good idea. So that's the sort of basic guideline that I discuss with owners, that if they, if the breed average is eight, well, then you really don't want any hip that scores more than four, really. And again, though, if you've got a nice dog and it's scoring five and they're mainly up at the top, not way down the bottom, well, then I think people have got to realise that they don't need to worry too much about it. The, the point of a, a um, kind of outlier result coming up every now and then, in the last few weeks, I've seen several dogs, Royal Show winners, that have scored 40s and 50s, and much to the owner's horror. And, th and they're people that have tried very hard to do the best they could with their dogs and their breeding program. So the hip dysplasia, unfortunately, is not like Mendel's peas, that you can't guarantee the outcome. You can only do things as, as well as possible following some guidelines. And unfortunately, people are now and then going to get very disappointed when one of these surprise results comes up, and which has got nothing to do with anything that they've necessarily done wrong in line with um, those comments a question that's come here is talking about the fact that um, people are suggesting that hip results and scores have risen significantly in recent times for around zero to two per hips to now five to seven per hips um, since this system I'm not sure that's their words, not mine, came into play. Are we scoring differently these days to seven to ten years ago? We shouldn't be because it's the same scoring scheme which we've cribbed from the BVA and which they're happy for us to use. Um, so people have their own opinions. As I've said, the, the chart is not black and white at every single gradation between naught and six. So you can have people that think it looks like it's mostly part of the description of three, and somebody else might think it's more closer to the description of four, because as you might expect, quite a lot of the ones don't fit either three or four exactly, and you have to decide which way you're going to go. Um, I think there's probably, for one reason or another, I think there were maybe more dogs that were getting total scores of naught than there perhaps ought to have been for quite some years. Um, I certainly would, 
personally rarely give a dog naught on both sides. I think I actually gave one a naught on one side the other day, which is also pretty unusual. But that doesn't matter if it's not one, two or three, it's, it's still a super result and people shouldn't be worried. Um, so a, a member is wanting to know, should their, one of their um, owners wants to have their toy breed uh, x-rayed at the time of, de uh, time of desexing? And would you recommend that the x-ray be done at the beginning of sedation? Oh, I think I think it um, if, if they've got to do the um, anaesthetic for the desexing, well, they might as well do that. I would have thought first and get the that side of it done. And if they want to do the um, the, the X-ray later on, that's fine. I don't think um, they'll get too much interference with the um, any artifacts coming from the surgery surgery that's going to be done. But I don't, I don't think it matters which way around you're going to do it. Um, as long as the dog's in a um, satisfactory state to do its de sexy, I'm sure it'll be perfectly satisfactory to do the um, hip x rays. Mm -hmm. um, another question if both parents score under six for hips and the offspring scores over 15, do we need to look back generations for the reason for the high score? Oh. I think it's it's really difficult. I, um, the you you have a lot of information about a dog if you've got its X-ray. You've got something like in the progeny testing side of things. You've got about sixty percent of what you need to know what the dog can tell you from the one dog. You you know a bit more from its parents, but not that much. Um, and you can keep worrying yourself to death about this um, rather than saying, well, this is just the way hip dysplasia goes. And I don't, if you start trying to hunt for an indi you know, one individual dog that you think might be a problem, unless you're doing major progeny testing, and when, when some of that was done by Willis, who provided the information uh, to some breed clubs for a minimal cost, there were certainly dogs that stud dogs with good hips themselves, bred to bitches with good hips, produced a large number of offspring with poor quality hips. And there are other dog, stud dogs with good hips, bred to bitches with not so good hips that produced good puppies compared with the bitches. And we did have in our study we did on guide dog elbows some time ago, we had one bitch that had been mated to three different dogs um, and 40% of her puppies had elbow dysplasia and another bitch who was mated at times to the same three dogs, she had 2% of her puppies with elbow dysplasia. So there are certainly animals that have um, a major impact or can have a major impact on the outcome of what's being produced. But I would think that it's bad enough getting a dog with a high score rather than then spending the next two weeks trying to work out where it all came from because I don't think you'll find anything useful properly. Uh, another question, Roger. Um, a person has uh, elbow scores with zero millimetres on both elbows but a grade of one. Well, I guess that's what um, you would have got from, from, I don't know how old this result is, but certainly for some time back, some people were grady. That's what you would get with the IEWG. That will be a, a no millimeter grade one will be that some non-measurable change is present. So the, the, the Rotties would get a B for that. And, um, so that's what my interpretation of a no no millimeters grade one, and we did quite a lot of those some time ago, but we've stopped that recently because it was causing a bit of confusion. The it really meant that they had this sclerotic change, which is the earliest radiographic change, which appears to be associated with the 
three major conditions that cause elbow dysplasia and not with any other issues that I'm aware of at the moment. So I think that's what that result would mean that it had got, if you like, the mildest reported change indicating a positive of elbow dysplasia. Um, uh, somebody asks, should they x-ray their min pins as well as their rottweilers? <laughs> We're going to make them do something. Uh, they... No, 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 I'm sure they didn't mean that. <laughs> they, well, if they want to, they, they might as well, but they're prepared to find something wrong. That's all I can say. I mean, <laughs> you don't, don't, don't think because of these little things that go charging around madly, they're going to be necessarily all right. But if they want to do it, I, I don't see any reason to say no. Um, they have to bear in mind the minor risks of anesthesia and all the rest of it. And in relation to how serious a problem it is in the breed, it, it's a bit like um, uh, everything else that we're talking about these days and trying to um, measure risk um, and need to investigate the risk as much as possible or not. Or just to take it that min pins are going to be min pins anyway. They're more likely to get mm. like Calvary Perth or something anyway, a vascular necrosis. Um, these are de this is a detailed question. Interested oh, yeah. to know whether any studies have shown the predictive value of hip and elbow scoring in the con context of their associations with clinical manifestations of hip and elbow osteoarthritis and DJD. That is, how well do the scores predict the likelihood and or severity of osteoarthritis and degenerative joint disease in an individual animal? Um, I'm not sure how much has been done with the scoring system looking at that, but that's the, one of the main bases of the pen hit scheme, where they're looking at the degree of distraction in the dogs and they have a 30% a um, break line when the ones that have got the tighter hips will score less than 30 and then the, or 0.3 I should say and then the ones that are um, above 0.3 are more likely to get um, osteoarthritic change later in life although there's absolutely no guarantee that any of them will. Um, so they, that um, is one of the reasons why some people like the pen hip system because they, um, uh, that, that, that part of the report which suggests you have tight hips unlikely to get um, secondary changes and in the other side of the line if you've got loose hips you're more likely to get secondary changes. We did a very small not um, publishable study in, in German Shepherds many years ago when we offered to look at dogs that were five years past their initial radiograph and looked at their hips under sedation, in this case not under anaesthesia, and we found very little change in most of them. The one that changed most dramatically was the one that had the most dramatic hips first time round as well. So we didn't find too much progression in the majority of those dogs over the five year period, but that was a fairly small group. So we, we presume that when we find laxity, as it does the pen hip group, that we would expect that to be the earliest stages of the potential further development of hip dysplasia. There is some kind of difference between the way Americans seem to talk about hip dysplasia. They don't seem to class laxity so much as being part of hip dysplasia. And they, it's only when they get the secondary changes. But I think um, because you can get some dogs that have got serious laxity and nothing else, that hip dysplasia can be basically laxity alone without any secondary arthritic change so the terminology that gets used is a bit cross crosses over a bit differently now and then 
Thank you. Thanks, Roger. Um, would you like to move on to the next the next section? Um, okay. So we've got something about beside breeding dogs with lower scores, what other protocols could help with obtaining and sustaining lower scores? Well, I guess you're going to have to go along and get some of the more um, complicated things like progeny testing and EBVs and all that sort of things done. And I, I guess um, that should be done mainly with the consultation of a geneticist. And you've got a lovely geneticist in Sydney, Claire Wade, who I'm sure if the, um, the dog world was to find some money to support her, I'm sure she'd find some postgraduate students to do some work on things that um, might go together with that sort of stuff. Are CT scans the future for elbow screening? I guess screening at the moment is looking for secondary changes in the elbow. And the presumption is made that when secondary changes are found, that we're dealing with either a fragmented medial coronoid process, an OCD on the medial side of the humeral condyle, or both. And the third condition it's looking, including in the same thing, is UAP, ununited anconeal process. These aren't all necessarily exactly the same pathogenesis, but the three conditions that occur in the elbow, which lead to arthritic change at some stage, uh, usually anyway. Um, so that, that's the screening measurement of something being present, says yes, it's an FCP and or OCD because you can see the UAP very easily. You can't see the other two in routine flexed elbow radiographs all that often. You can you can pick it up in a number of them, but the um, it's the arthritic change we're looking for. CTs are used much more for diagnosis um, because the um, surgeons are wanting to know um, what they are maybe having to deal with in the um, inside the joint when they do their arthrotomies. Um, the next two we've dealt with. Somebody wanted to know what my opinion was of JPS surgery. I don't really have one. Um, I'm not involved in that activity. It's a issue which has some welfare aspects to it. Um, in many cases, people are doing surgery which may or may not be useful on dogs, um, which may or may not um, have a clinical problem. Um, but the other concern would be that some of those dogs, they should get desexed at the same time as they have surgery. And, uh, and if they do happen to improve the hip um, anatomy, they don't, we don't want those dogs being part of breeding programs. Is ulnar osteotomy the best way to manage elbow dysplasia? Uh, well, my answer to that would be it's a way to manage it. Um, it fits in with um, some of the thoughts about how the problem actually develops. In some dogs, it appears to be an extremely painful procedure, which can be managed with the modern drugs that we have these days. Um, certainly when we did the earlier guide dog work and around the world, when um, elbow dysplasia was becoming more and more apparent to be affecting all sorts of breeds, arthrotomy was the common surgical technique and in our study, having a guide dog which had an elbow problem, which had surgery, the surgery had no influence or not on whether the dog completed its um, training program and went on to be a working guide dog. So even though that was um, an, an open arthrotomy in those days, 
the with removal of the abnormal areas we had um, really quite good results with that um, and then it went on to like a lot of things these days with arthroscopy it's believed to be less in uh, a morbid morbidity impact on the joint if you do it with arthroscopy rather than an arthrotomy when you make an incision and open up the joint and certainly there are people that have been doing elbow osteotomies for elbow dysplasia now for quite a long time they've done different techniques they've sometimes it's been used with uaps in the hope that the uap might might join on which it seems to in some cases but by no means all of them so it's a way that some of the surgeons these days like to approach the management of elbow dysplasia but i'm sure there are others that would be still doing either arthroscopy or are more like or arthrotomies what and as long as it gets the dog right it probably doesn't matter all that much how common are transitional vertebrae at the lumbar sacral junction and whilst congenital should caution be taken when breeding this has become a um, quite large topic um, these days and the reported incidence in breeds is between th three and sort of 40%. So there's a massive breed variation in the likelihood of seeing change. In, when we do, Jenny and I do the German Shepherds, we comment if we find a transitional vertebra and the transitional vertebra, the sort of typical transitional vertebra is when the last of the so-called lumbar vertebra doesn't know whether it really wants to be a lumbar vertebra or whether it wants to be part of the sacrum so it develops abnormal um, transverse processes and it may decide to fuse or it may decide to rub against the uh, ilium so there can be issues with it um, it can be a nuisance when you're doing hip dysplasia x-rays because it means that in the more severe cases there can be asymmetry of the pelvis and if you position the dog exactly how you like to position them routinely you may well find you've got a crooked picture and so in those dogs you actually have to repeat the x-ray and tilt it in order to straighten the pelvis up so it's a nuisance in some cases from the point of view of um, taking good quality x-rays. Um, some of you in, the, in Victoria may have remember the wonderful greyhound man veterinarian we had called Diamond Jim Gannon. And he ran a greyhound clinic at Werribee when I was there. And he used to send dogs down to us because they had a problem with a transitional vertebra at the lumbar sacral junction. We couldn't believe that he could actually identify things like that, but he's got wonderful fingers. And we'd x-ray them and they presented these two, I remember particularly, they presented because they came out of the boxes fine, but found the very great difficulty in going around the bend. When we looked at them, they'd formed a false joint between the transverse process of the vertebra and the wing of the ilium. So you could see this poor dog would, no longer, would be struggling going around the corner. It's become a very popular area to report on for abnormalities. Um, and there are a whole different classification of levels of change in the last vertebra. There are other sites where problems occur besides the transverse processes. There's a paper from Australia in, on Labradors where they've got a very high percentage of abnormality, but that's a different sort of change as far as I can understand where the caudal part of the sacrum actually fuses with the front part of the caudal vertebra. So that's not the typical uh, transitional vertebra that you see in um, that's been sort of the one that we'd expect to look at. So 
It's certainly an issue. Um, there have been studies suggesting that it's having clinical impact on some uh, working dogs. So quite a few of the uh, police and people are getting lateral views done as well as the VD view uh, when they're doing their routine exams. Um, I think it's uh, one of those things where I guess people need to try and find out how many of these dogs are really having a clinical problem and then deciding whether there should be some major attempt to do something about it or not. There certainly is some work that suggests there is some genetic linkage in the Labradors and um, I'm not so sure about what, um, how far everybody takes it. Certainly the numbers of shepherds that we see with it, Jenny and I, uh, when I was talking to the breed recorder a while ago, is a, is a very, very low percentage indeed. So. There's yeah. a couple of other questions here, Roger, um, yep. that I didn't want to miss. Um, one is uh, somebody said the Queensland French Bulldog Club, I think, says their puppy should be x-rayed at eight weeks. Their puppy's spine should be x-rayed at eight weeks. They're bad enough to look at when they're a year or more. I hate to look at them at eight weeks. I mean, yeah. we... Yeah. We we certainly, you know, when I was at Werribee, we certainly saw a very, well, relatively small number of screw tail breeds with neurological signs related to um, some abnormal vertebral development. But they were things that you could see readily on a plane x-ray and a lateral view quite easily. If the problem with the looking at those vertebrae is that some of the ones that are very wedge shaped in a lateral view, most of those in the opposite plane will be butterfly or a bow tie type vertebrae. They just look like the shape of a, of a butterfly with the two, two wings out or a bow tie with its either side. But if you're trying to look at a lot of those dogs um, with a screening x-ray, their vertebra the vertebrae are so, can be so crowded and the, the shape of the back makes it really, really difficult to identify whether these are what you could draw as a definite butterfly or not. So we tend to say that the very wedge-shaped ones, which are a very obvious V, and some of which lead to quite obvious change in angulation of the spine, um, we just class those, well, I certainly class those as a three because I know that the, if you can get a view in the opposite plane, well, then it will be a, a, a butterfly. So it's really hard. I, I, the only thing is, you know, you ask the question, or I could ask the question is, why are they doing it eight weeks? Does that mean if they find something wrong with their colon? Um, I, it's the... I assume that the ones that we see most of the time are quite happy, even though some of them would have no idea that, that, that how their backs look at all. So I would think it's quite a quite challenging exercise looking at them at eight weeks of age. But if that's what they're doing, good luck. But, but, but I'd love to know exactly why and what happens to the puppies. There's another yes. question here come in to me just privately. I'm not sure why, but uh, <laughs> on Frenchies uh, for you, Roger. It says, we're seeing an increase in sacrum spina bifida where the L6, L7 have a hemivertebra. Why, what exactly is this? Well, that's, it's part and parcel of... Um, of the, I, I presume this is, uh, what, was it a screw tail breed? Uh, French Bulldogs. Oh, well, yes. I mean, they can get anything in their backs. I mean, they're, they're unbelievable, some of them. It's, I think it's just something that's turning up at that level. And um, it's, if you like, it's getting in the more advanced version of it. So the spina bifida means that there is an incomplete, um, fusion of the two sides, the laminae of the vertebrae um, over the spinal cord, which I guess is um, 
leaves it open to potential uh, problems later on. And the butterfly vertebrae is, is a bit what some of those things look like anyway. So it's just another of the sites that they get um, with their weird and wonderful results of being screw tailed. Um, Roger, there's a question about how we compare our hip results with international results, um, uh, such as grading. Um, yeah, and do we still have gradings here? And if so, uh, can they be can they be compared with overseas gradings? The when um, I first came out here, um, the AVA provided a referral service on hip dysplasia assessment, which was graded from naught to four. And it was a thing that was done by Dick Dixon on his, on his own, I think. And then we changed around a bit and we started to get a bit more input into the panel and things. And we graded elbow, sorry, hips from naught to four. The Willis came out um, visiting, as he did fairly regularly then, and he suggested that if we were going to grade, it was better from his perspective as a statistician if we had seven grades. So we graded from naught to six. And as I mentioned earlier in the night, whilst the BBA claims it never graded, it sort of graded because it, it graded you as pass, breeder's letter or fail. Once we had these seven different grades, that we found that the um, correlation between the different panelists was not all that good. And of course, if you've only got seven steps, it's pretty easy to jump from a little bit better than somebody who thinks it's a little bit better than three goes to a two, and somebody who thinks it's a little bit worse than a three it goes to four. So you've got a big difference. The uh, that's why the scoring system came in in the UK where you were if you like you've got 56 grade sorry 53 grades in each um, hip the um, grading system when we were doing the scoring and giving them a grade we had poorer correlation in the grading than we did in the hip scoring so we pulled hip scoring out. It was done for, for that reason partly, and also from the point of view that with at least with the scoring, we had breed averages in those days, which we could say that the dog that we'd provided a result was either better than the breed average, on the breed average, or much worse than the breed average. The score didn't tell the breeder really anything about where that dog sat in relation to the rest of the breed. So that's why we dropped it. Now, the people in Europe grade, they aren't all the same, and there are papers out showing how these different grading systems overlap. The Americans have a different system as well. And some people in this country will provide what's called an Australian grade, except that I don't know why anybody wants one because I don't know what it means. And then they give them an international grade. If anybody asks me about their dog getting an international grade, my answer is that they should get it examined in the country they want to get the grading for because those people know how their grading system works and everybody else is having a bit of a guess at it. So it's, Having got a scoring system where you know where your dog sits in relation to everybody else's dog, um, I think that's a far better scenario than giving it a grade, which is really difficult when you're trying to decide if something that scores three for subluxation and nothing else on that side is better or worse than the dog that scores four with a two, two and a one. I don't know. It, it's very difficult, I think, to grade. And the, I'm happy to support the scoring system. I really don't mind. If anybody wants to put the grades on, 
well they can do it um, but they need to people need to be aware that it's not a uniform system across europe either so i don't i don't participate in it anymore thanks roger there's another question here i've been told that all of my natural bobtail pups have spina bifida should i do spine x-rays on my pups while doing hips and elbows this is rotties Mm. Uh, well, I guess they're going to, they're going to, it depends, I suppose, if they've got a clinical diagnosis of something that's been wrong, I mean, they've got the need to go to go and investigate it. But with a lot of those things, you wouldn't be investing it, investigating it with routine x-rays which you will be doing with the hips and elbows you'd be investigating it with cts so um mm. they they that will be much more important I, i've certainly seen some years ago we saw some funny rotties that had got that were quite hairy and had some terrible looking backs um with funny vertebrae in them so i don't know um mm. i think yeah they i they can get a plain film if they like. I mean, the, the lower end is going to appear in the VD picture and if they want to do a lateral one as well, well, there may be some useful information comes from that, but for the detailed information, they're going to need, they're going to need CT. The, the, the person has just commented, it's not clinical, it's just what other breeders are saying. <laughs> well, I would ignore the other breeders until proved otherwise. Yeah. So, um, and also somebody, <laughs> somebody else has asked that we've commented on everything about genetics and weight and nutrition, et cetera, but are there any ideas about optimal uh, whelping box shape and surface texture for floors for puppy development? Oh, well, well, I think it, it, it's sensible to, to provide them with a surface that's, they can get a reasonable grip on. I mean, you wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought you'd bring them up on a, a floorboards that are reasonably shiny um, versus either carpet or, you know, even concrete, if it's a bit rougher, is pretty good going. Um, but yeah, it makes sense that they thought they're not going to stretch and strain themselves any more than necessary. I mean, they've got a, Plenty to do with growing up without having to compete with terrible footing, I guess. They also need to be out and about in decent um, uh, areas as well and getting getting plenty of exercise and learning how to use themselves. But yeah, I don't know of anything that's talked about the size of welcoming box and whether you're limiting the room. No, it's not not my cup of tea. Thanks. Thanks, Roger. So there's just that last question now concerning the Rottweiler Breed Council. Um, can you help us with that? Um, there's a comment here about the ABA stock, the Rotties being included on the database. Uh, I don't know where that, exactly where that comes from, except that the ABA um, and the ANKC run a joint scheme for quite quite some years and um, for one reason or another um, the A some of members of the ABA panel people decided that they didn't want to be part of the um, ABA ANKC scheme anymore and pulled the pin. Now the I don't know what the Roddies do with their results. I know they have breed recorders, a national one, and they have some state ones. And I can't see any reason at all why all their information wouldn't be or couldn't be incorporated in the ORCID database. It just seems to me that um, if if they're a long way behind with it, it's, it's going to be quite a lot of work to do to um, put them in. But I would have thought that they, 
ought to be in and, and again I'm not sure exactly where the shepherds sit with the same system um, I know I guess Karen has a, a lot to do with all organizations like involving hips and shepherds and cheds and ANKCs and things so I think she's managed to get a lot of the shepherd data in there but um, it makes sense that these clubs that have their own schemes for their own reasons should be participating in the whole um, ANKC ORCID system because there are obviously considerable numbers of people who are not members of those clubs who breed both breeds and the more information we have to, um, from to put into the database the more useful that information ought to be so i don't know why it was stopped it was probably something to do with the change from the aba ankc system um when the there were problems with the numbers of people on the panel and um i suspect it's just one of those things that happen in life there's some changes made but there's i can't see any reason ron might have some reason but i can't see any reason why they wouldn't be included together. The comment is that because it's it's the paperwork's on the CHEDS form rather than the Breed Council paperwork, but, um, uh, sorry, ran the other way, it's on the Breed Council paperwork and not on the CHEDS paperwork, but I can't see why you can't fill in, fill in two pieces of paper. I mean, you can do it on both forms, surely. Well, that's up to, um, I guess, the Breed Clubs to do. I don't know. The, the much of the same information is on the um those uh, club individual club sheets that's on on the um orchid um forms and i, I really um i would have thought that the they require the roddies require microchips and they require um, the paper contract number to appear on the image and they um, like if you can to people to put the the dog's regist uh, registration number on there as well but the so they're they're um, going to be genuinely represent representative of the actual dog that it's um, that's named on the uh, paperwork so I would have thought the integrity of their system and of the shepherd systems perfectly adequate to find a way of getting those um, results all incorporated together. It seems we have enough divisions as it is um, without having to have more and we should all be trying to work together to simplify these systems. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks, Roger. So that's sort of covered all the um, written questions, submitted questions, and a fair few that have come through on the chat. Um, if anybody else has got any questions they want addressed, can you send th something through on the chat quick as? And um, then, oops, what's happened? We've lost videos. Oh, is that my fault? There yes. you are again. <laughs> oh, well, yes, I, I, I turned, turned yourself and me off some time ago. But I'm just trying to find Ron again. And I thought I'd just turn his on. Let me continue scrolling down. Oh, no. I've, oh, well, Roger's still here. If we've lost Roger, that's be either because I'm talking or the internet's become cranky. I'm here still. <laughs> right, yeah, I can see you. Yes, um, there has been another question come through, um, and I'll read this out. Um, Roger, if you're looking for OCD, FCP, or UAP, what millimetre of change is recorded before? the grade on elbows and now it's scrolling the, down. I can't stop it. Well, the, the grade one 
I would, if, if there's a little bit of change that pokes out beyond the Ankeneal process, that would be, for me, would be classed as grade one, less than 0 0.5 millimetres. Okay, thank you. As, as it says, two of these are breaks so sound more serious than less than half a millimetre of arthritic change. Sorry? Yeah. What was um, two of these are breaks so sound more serious than less than half a millimetre of arthritic change. So that's UAP and FCP, I assume. What does she mean by breaks? They're saying that they're a, mm, I don't know. Well, the, well the, 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 the ununited anchorneal process is a weird thing. It, it's a, only in some breeds that the um, bone in the ulna there grows like the end of long bones. And in some German shepherds, which is the commonest breed with it, never ever have an issue. They never have a separate ossification centre and they just grow normal ulnas. Some of them have separate ossification centers which will join up before 140 days, which is the cutoff for being normal or abnormal. And others will not join up and may or may not cause lameness down the track. Um, and some of them will cause serious lameness later on. And it happens so much later in life that um, some of them almost feel that they've got such big elbows that they must have a tumour growing there, but it's uh, just a big osteoarthritic mass due to the UAP. The FCP is a probably a, degener uh, a developmental change due to a, a pressure type problem. An OCD of the medial side of the condyle is very similar to the OCD lesions we see in the shoulder and the elbow joint. So the, the three changes are not um, necessarily exactly the same as each other and may have quite different um, pathogenesis, which is why the um, ulnar osteotomy is being considered by some people as the method of treatment for the problem, um, especially for the FCP, because it changes the alignment in the within the joint and alters the uh, pressure dynamics. Thank you. Um, so, harking back to another comment, do you consider there could be a link between floor surfaces in warping boxes and future hip dysplasia? I very, very much doubt it. I mean, the dear old mother nature is remarkably resilient and um, you know, these, these people, you're more likely to get issues if you lock things up and don't let them get out and about and doing all the things they'd like to do. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm sure if you, there would, somebody could, you know, you wouldn't, I can't imagine the ethics committee allowing it, but, you know, why would you want to put things on a floor that's not likely to be suitable? If you've got a, a, a uh, box that you don't think is ideal will change it to the one you like and just i can't see any issue with it really it shouldn't shouldn't be a problem um do you believe that the radiographer and x-ray quality contributes to the eventual score the uh, the quality of most of the radiographs these days, which are, are they're almost 100% computer generated ones these days. Um, the initial images are not necessarily all as good as they could be, but if they come in the DICOM format, um, you can actually window them. And so you can improve the appearance of the original appearance of some of the images. It doesn't mean that with these computer systems that everything that they take will automatically be able to be made into a quality image that can be assessed uh, properly. 
so there are two things that can go wrong one is one is the positioning um and that's something that if if i see a dog with the hip situation with a hip score that's 40 and it's positioned badly well i don't bother to get that repeated because it's probably going to get 39 or 49 or something instead if it's something that sits around the breed average with a tilted pelvis i would advise that the image is taken again because i don't think you can't guess what's going to happen if the pelvis was square and you need to get a square pelvis to get to give the owners and the dog a fair result for what its anatomy looks like so you can the positioning's important the uh, exposure factors are important and the other thing that's important is the labeling but it, um, the one thing I would li like to emphasize to everybody is you please try and get the veterinarians to provide images which are in DICOM format, which are larger images, but they can be manipulated. And you can't measure accurately a JPEG elbow if it's got osteophytes, when you're having to start off trying to calibrate it first and then measure it. and the chances are you're going to add of you know half a millimeter quite easily to what should be there or not have the half a millimeter there it's bad enough measuring elbow changes in good quality images that you can um where you can use the computer um and with the jpeg images you're just you're having to guess you can't uh, really get a what i would classify as a fair result for either the dog or the owner. So sure, if things are not ideal, you can get images that are less than ideal quality. And if the presentation of the image is less than ideal quality, um, there needs to be some comment made in the report to identify the problem. And I tend to, if I see them again, I wouldn't charge a new price for looking at them. Thanks, Roger. There's just a couple more questions to wrap up. Um, many years ago in Ridgebacks, we saw a bit of OCD. Can you say whether this is more rare these days with better nutrition or are we just lucky? Um, I'm not seeing um, lots of cases these days because I don't, I've departed from Werribee and I go to work by going to the post office in Lansfield and coming home and seeing what's on the computer. So I can't answer that question um, as to what's happening these days. I know there were a few, particularly in the shoulder joint with, with um, Ridgebacks. The only thing about the shoulder joint is it's um, surgery of that problem usually gives extraordinarily good results so i always used to tell the students if you find one in a ridge back don't give it to the boss to do do it yourself because it doesn't really matter what you do to it it'll almost be perfectly normal without any problems thank you and um do you have a process for quality control by auditing randomly and blindly and what is an acceptable deviation well we have we have no quality control process at the moment we did when we um had the ava a and k c scheme and we also did when we had the larger ava panel we we um sent the same images around to everybody and um we um met later on as a group and um, we were using some of the monies from the uh, AVA coffers which came from the hip and elbow scheme to get everybody to attend and we went through changes it turned out that most of the time there was an odd person that was maybe a little bit soft and an odd one that was a little bit hard, but the bulk were in the middle. And um, I think it's something that we ought to do with the four of us again. I know the ABA and KC used to do it 
or the ABA did it, they managed some system of sending them out without us knowing about it anyway. The ones we did with the ABA earlier early on, we all knew what was happening because we just got a whole series of images to read at the same time. But, you know, we there's nothing really wrong with that either if you're trying to sort things out. Um, I don't, I'm not a, I can't tell you anything about the statistics about how much variation is acceptable. Okay, um, so I think I think we've um, we've exhausted everybody. That's good. Time for gin and tonic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I'd I'd really like to sincerely thank both you and Ron for um, spending an evening rabbiting on to us and we'd really like to offer you this gift a virtual gift um, and hope hope that hope that you enjoy it both of you <laughs> very good well thank you very much and thank you for everybody that's um participated and if they've got further questions please send them in and we'll try and um, provide some reasonably sensible answers I think the main things to remember is it's not a black and white area by any stretch of imagination and little bits of departures from what you'd like to have as the very best may not be really all that much of a problem as you think. But the geneticists are the ones that we need to listen to and um, that and Claire Way says that all the schemes around the world, if the dog world took notice, doesn't really matter what scheme it is, should lead to improvement in hips. So good night to everybody and thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ron. Thanks, Roger. Okay. Thanks, Ron. Yeah. And thank you everybody for attending. It's been wonderful to have such a turnout. Thanks, Sylvia. Thanks, Margaret. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thanks, you host. Good night. Thank you.